Betsy Sanchez is a professor of horticultural systems management at Pennsylvania, U Pennsylvania State University with 20 years experience working as a vegetable specialist. Also teaches the undergraduate courses, vegetable crops, horticultural systematics, and co-teaches gardening for fun and profit and hydroponics and aquaponics. She also has an extension and applied research program focusing on the issues important to vegetable farmers with an emphasis on environmental sustainability. And with that, it's um, my pleasure to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have uh, Elsa speak to us here today. Um, I, I think Elsa's ready for us. Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Elsa. So today I'm going to talk about growing tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers. Um, but before I get started, I wanted to point out that my email address is on the screen. And if you need to get a hold of me at any time, that's probably the easiest and quickest way um, to do that. So I'm going to launch right in. I was asked to talk about cultivars and IPM. And so the way this is gonna be organized today is first I'm gonna talk about a strategy for selecting cultivars. Then I'm gonna talk about growing um, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers. And then at the end, um, an IPM um, approach. And so looking at cultivars, um, there are a lot of options out there, which is exciting, but sometimes it can be intimidating um, too. Um, as gardeners, um, some things to consider are your gardening philosophy and you know what makes the most sense for you there's organic seed out there which has met the um, requirements of the national organic standard untreated seed is another um, choice that i often go for in my garden these are seeds that have not been um, treated with pesticides um, and then you can also get treated seed too you have the option of starting things by transplants and by seed. I kind of like to do a combination in my garden. You, there's just so much more variety when you start by seed than when you, you know, are just selecting from pop-up um, stands or from um, garden centers. Um, but there's also a lot of convenience to starting off with a, a, a transplant than, you know, starting by seed too. So there's a lot of options out there. When looking at cultivars, it's really important to consider um, disease resistance, disease tolerance, because this is going to go a long way to help avoiding having issues with certain pests. So for certain cultivars of uh, vegetables, breeders have been able to keep a step ahead of some of the important diseases. And so yesterday when I met with Dick and Chuck, uh, Dick said, I hope that you're going to talk about tomato blights. And so I'm going to kind of weave that in throughout um, this talk today. But when I'm growing in my garden, I'm the big one for me is late blight. Um, and so I always look for cultivars that have late blight resistance because then it's just I'm starting off with plants that are going to be resistant to that problem. And it's not that, saying that I won't get it at all, but if I do, it's not going to be as severe. And it just goes a long way to starting off um, uh, your garden. And so here are some cultivars, for example, that have resistance to early blight and late blight. And so these are some great ones to start with. If you, if you haven't tried them, you have these issues in your garden. So I wanted to also give you some tips for reading seed catalogs. And so when you read a seed catalog or a seed packet or any description of a, a cultivar, it's important to read between the lines in addition to reading what is actually there. So for example, this is a description, um, highly productive black heirloom tomato with excellent flavor and fruit quality. So what happens is that usually what's being highlighted are the best features of that cultivar. And so when I see that, I think, oh, that's pretty exciting, but I don't see anything mentioned about any disease resistance and probably because it doesn't have any or it has very little. So highly adaptable, large fruited ancho pepper, ideal for chilirianos. So I'm like, oh, I love chilirianos. That's, that's a good start. But again, I don't see anything about disease um, resistance or tolerance. And so that kind of makes me think, hmm, is that gonna be an issue with this particular cultivar? And the last one, widely adapted organic bell pepper with broad disease resistance package. Well, now I know that, okay, I'm gonna start off with some good disease resistance, but what about the flavor? Is this gonna be have good quality? So a tip is to read what's there, but also kind of consider what's not there um, as well. 
also the All America Selections cultivar um, are cultivars that are a, another great place to, to start. So these are, it's a program that's throughout the United States where different cultivars of flowers and vegetables are trialed and gardens throughout the United States. And so the cream of the crop, you know, across all of these gardens get this All America Selection winner um, uh, labeling. And so you can find things like, you know, tomatoes and squashes and cucumbers and peppers. And these are a great way to start. And if you can combine these things too, that's kind of great too. So for example, when we were looking at the resistance to early blight and late blight, there was a couple of cultivars there, um, Jasper and um, Juliet, that are also all America selection winners. So you're going to combine this great disease resistance with um, a, a plant that also has done well in gardens um, across the U.S. Other places to check are um, other gardeners, see what's worked, you know, for your neighbor, what hasn't worked for your neighbor. That's a, um, a good uh, conversation to have. There are seed exchanges, a lot of plant cells that happen early in the spring. Farmers markets and plant stands. Um, we have here where I live in central Pennsylvania, uh, this pop-up plant stand, and it's a commercial vegetable farmer, and they sell a lot of flowers and a lot of vegetables. And the vegetables they sell are the vegetables that they're also growing on the farm. And so these are vegetables that have resistance to diseases that are common in, in my area. And they're also, um, I know that they do well because the farmer is also growing them. So I, that's where I get my transplants when I buy them. So those are just some tips for selecting cultivars. Um, now I'm going to talk about growing uh, peppers, cucumbers, and um, tomatoes, starting with the things that kind of apply to all of them. And then I'll talk about each one individually. So don't overlook the site. Um, you want to have a site that has full sun for these three um, these three plants because you're going to maximize not only the productivity of the plant, but also it can go a long way, for example, helping the leaves dry off after they've been wet or after the dews in the morning. And that can help also with uh, managing some of your um, diseases in particular. Um, so at least six to eight hours of full sun is an ideal spot for your vegetables. Um, it's always good um, to get your soil tested. And John talked about that in his talk too. Um, if you do it about once every three years, um, that will that's a good starting point. You know, you can do it more often, but at least once every three years. And that will let you know not only what's going on in your soil, but it also usually comes with some sort of recommendations for how to adjust like the pH if you're out of the range, the optimal range for uh, vegetables. But it'll also let you know like how much uh, fertilizers to add um, as well. Um, select a site with good drainage, and if you don't have good drainage, you can do things like build um, a raised um, bed, um, like the one in this picture, um, and that will help with uh, drainage in a spot maybe that didn't have good drainage to begin with. Access to water is critical. Um, so this is also something that um, John mentioned. We have a lot of water um, in our area. Um, However, we also have periods of drought that always happen every growing season. And so you need to have, be able to water uh, vegetables or it's just, it's not gonna work out all that well for you. So make sure you have some sort of access to water. So as far as determining nutrient needs, um, soil testing um, really goes a long way to know what's in the soil. And that way we're not over applying things like uh, uh, phosphate and potash. Um, and, you know, things like phosphate, if we have too much nitrogen, um, those, if they find their ways to bodies of water, that can be a real environmental hazard. So it's an important to, if you're not using soil testing, to at least use a recommendation and not just, you know, um, go out there and just, you know, put some. It's important to, to do it based on um, data. Um, so as a general recommendation for nitrogen for uh, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers, about three and a half pounds of nitrogen per 100 square feet um, is, um, should be adequate to get you through the growing season. Um, and so you can apply a portion before planting. This is what we uh, commonly do uh, as commercial farmers, what I, what I do in my garden. If you have a heavy soil, like I'm in an area where there's a lot of clay to our soil, then you might 
might apply anywhere from 50 to 60% of the nitrogen before planting. If you're in an area where the soil's more sandy, where you have, um, you know, the water drains really quickly from your soil, then maybe apply 30% of the nitrogen before planting. And then you'll, whatever you have left, you can split that and apply it three to four weeks after um, planting, and then again, six to eight weeks after planting. Or you can fertigate. So, and this is just um, applying those nutrients, applying some sort of a soluble um, fertilizer through either your drip irrigation line, if you're using a drip line, or um, even through your water hose, if that's how you're irrigating your garden. Trellising is um, really important, especially if you don't have a lot of space. Um, I know I'm, in my garden, I'm always trying to cram a few extra plants in. Um, so using that vertical space can be really helpful. And then it also can help with fruit quality. Like for example, when your cucumbers, if the fruit touches the ground, you get a yellow spot on the spot where it touches the ground. So if they're hanging though, you don't get that spot. And so that can also help with the quality of the, the fruit that you're growing. So um, this is done commonly for cucumbers and tomatoes. This is um, one of the trellises that was in my garden. It's just kind of a homemade thing. You can also um, buy them too. And I've got you know, some pictures of those later on um, as well. So those are things that are kind of general to um, all of them together. So now I'm gonna talk about tomatoes in particular. And first, I'm going to start talking about different types of tomatoes that you have options for. The exciting thing about being a gardener is, you know, in the field, things are kind of more set. But as a gardener, you can just, you know, like the rules go out the window and you can experiment and, and have a little bit more fun with your plants. And so we have two basic types of tomatoes. We have determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. And so determinate ones are the one they, they flower from the top down. So they're going to grow, they're going to set um, kind of their height, um, and then they're going to start flowering, and then they flower kind of from the top down. These are used, obviously, in gardens. Um, we use them in when we're growing them commercially outdoors in the field, or we can use them in high tunnels. And a lot of times when you see them in containers, it's usually a determinate tomato that's in the container. Then there's indeterminate ones, and these are the vining ones. Um, these ones tend to be softer, the fruit. They have more gel and thinner walls. They are perfect for gardens. However, commercial farmers generally are not growing these outdoors. They'll grow them in greenhouses where they can train them up, or they'll grow them in high tunnels. So in high tunnels, you kind of have the option of doing determinate or, or indeterminate um, cultivars, as we do in gardens. So I want to show you a couple of pictures of these uh, tomatoes. So these are determinate tomatoes that are being grown um, commercially. And so you can see the plants aren't going to get as tall. They're not quite as viney. They're still vines, right? But they're not going to get as long as the indeterminate um, tomatoes. And they're, they're staked and they're trained. So we have um, a stake. Um, and this is like a one by one um, stake. And then there's two plants between that stake. And then you can see there's twine. And so there's different layers of twine. And what um, you do is you wrap the twine around a stake, then you go between the plants, and then you go to the other stake and you wrap it around. You go all the way down the row and you do that. And then you come back. And when you go through the plants, you go the opposite direction. So the plants are sandwiched between that twine on either side. And this is a really simple method of training uh, tomatoes. And it's something that I do in my garden too. So that's why I wanted to, to show you that. And then here are some indeterminate type tomatoes that are being grown in a high tunnel. And so with the indeterminate types of tomatoes, what we usually do is there's some sort of a, a wire, a support wire going across the top. And then there is a twine that comes down from that wire. And usually there's one, maybe two, depending on how you train your tomatoes, twines per plant. And so that twine will go all the way down to the base of the plant, and then you'll train the tomato to a single stem. So there's quite a bit of pruning involved with this type of system. As a gardener, though, you can just, you know, put a higher um, trellis. You can let them grow along the ground. Um, I actually do something similar to this um, with uh, indeterminate plants in my backyard. 
um, I have a deck and I'll put like a cross wire just like this and the, the, the uh, trellis or uh, the twine will come down and I'll just train it up there um, on my back deck with the indeterminate tomatoes. And that seems to work really well. I, I really liked, this is the first year I tried that and I really, really enjoyed that. Tomatoes are self-pollinated. And what this means is that um, the flowers themselves, there's, they have the pollen from the same flower pollinates the same flower, if that makes sense. I'll, I'll describe a little bit more. So here is a tomato flower in the center. This is the ovary. This is what's going to develop into the fruit. And then here's the style and this is the stigma. So that those three pieces right there that make up the female part of the flower. The stigma is sticky and that is the part that receives the pollen. Then right to the outside of that, we have the stamens. And the stamens are made up of the filament, which is the stalk part, and the anther, which is the tips, and that's where the pollen is. So what happens is, you can see how the stamen is longer than the stigma, so it makes it so that it's easy for that pollen to make its way to that stigma. So it's self-pollinated, okay? So it all comes from, from one uh, flower. And that's important to know. Um, when we grow these actually in uh, uh, greenhouses, for example, outside it happens by itself, right? There's enough wind, there's enough movement that that pollen moves from the stamen to the stigma. You really don't have to think about it. But if we grow these inside like in a greenhouse, it's much more still and we have to help that happen. We either introduce bees or use electric bees in order to um, help pollination to occur or we have much lower yields. And so it's just an interesting thing, I think. As far as temperature goes, uh, tomatoes are a warm season crop. Um, the optimal temperature for growth is between 70 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. They do obviously grow when temperatures are above 75, but if it gets to be above um, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, what happens is you have some reproductive issues. So if you think back to that flower, I just showed you how the stamen was a little bit longer than the pistil, and so you could get the pollination. What will happen sometimes when temperatures get above 94 is that the stigma gets longer than the stamen and then you don't have good pollination. So you don't have good fruit set. So if you have temperatures above 94 degrees Fahrenheit during the day or 70 during the night, you can expect to have some poor fruit set, but all of that corrects itself once temperatures go back into that optimal um, zone or, or below 94 um, and above or below 70. As far as growing systems, I tend to think about like, what are commercial growers doing and how can I adapt that to my garden for growing systems? And so you can plant in the bare ground, meaning you just put your plant in the ground and you know there's nothing covering the ground. Um, some farmers do that. Um, there's also plastic culture system, and this is where you have a raised bed. The nice thing about the raised bed is that's good for drainage. It also increases the soil temperatures a little bit. And then they'll put a line of drip tape on top of that um, raised bed and cover it with black plastic primarily. You can also use red plastic, but in Pennsylvania uh, and, and actually in the Northeast, black is the, the workhorse of the, of the plastics. The reason farmers are doing that is you can get higher yield, you get good fruit size and quality, you know, the fruit is not touching the ground. It also, the plastic itself helps to manage weeds. And so this is a nice system and I've seen, uh, and I use actually in my garden, kind of a modified plastic culture system um, outside. No-till is all, another system that can be used for um, tomatoes and uh, for, this system is nice if you can grow uh, cover crops too. That can really, really help to improve your soil. It also helps to avoid um, erosion and runoff um, in your garden, which um, is always a good thing. And then if you're using particularly determinate types, you can also grow them in containers and as, as being shown in the picture. So if you are growing your own transplants, then you want them to be about five to six weeks old before you stick them in the ground. This is just um, kind of a recommendation. You can put them in when they're younger, you can put them in when they're older. This is just kind of a, a, an age to shoot for. If you don't get it though, don't let that stop you from planting them. 
You want to set them outside when soil temperatures are above 55 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is at a depth of about three inches in the ground after the danger of frost has passed. These will not tolerate um, any frost. If you are growing your own transplants, then you want to think about um, hardening them off before setting them outside. Because when we grow them inside, we're totally babying them, right? We're, they've got really great light. They've got, we're optimal moisture, we're fertilizing, but when they get outside, the conditions are a little bit rougher. And so if we harden them off, it helps them to um, transition to those outdoor conditions. And so doing things like uh, making the, the temperature a little bit cooler, maybe letting them dry off a little bit before watering, um, backing off a little bit on the fertility, all of those things can help um, to harden off your plants before uh, you um, set them out. If you set out your tomato plants too early, and um, what we mean by there is um, be, if it, uh, air temperatures are between 60 and 65 during the day, 15, 52 degrees at night, you can get cat facing. And that's what's shown in this picture right here. So these fruit, uh, the plants were set out too early. And so you get this cat facing, they're edible. It's not a disease or anything like that. Um, but you know, it's, they're not as pretty and they can be a little bit trickier to use. And we had this, um, this food scientist come to, to my vegetable crop class. I apologize. I'm gonna open the door and let my dog out. So this food scientist came and talked to us and she made me see tomatoes very differently. I see it from like a production kind of standpoint and she was looking at it from a food safety standpoint. And holes like you see, like in this fruit right here, that's cat faced or this year we had big issues with cracking because we had, you know, like these downpours of rain and then it would dry off a little and then downpours it would, and then so we, we saw a lot of cracking in fruit. Um, anyway, these holes are ideal entry points for like bacteria and foodborne diseases to enter. And so she was showing us this fruit and just gave me a new perspective about that. So even though you probably could eat this, I probably wouldn't from that standpoint. Um, planting tomatoes and peppers um, are unique in that most plants, when you plant them, you're gonna um, plant them to the, the level that they are um, in the transplant, right? So when I put this in the ground, normally I would put this up to here. But with tomatoes and peppers, they root super easily from the stem. And so you can plant them to the, the first true leaves or the first cotyledons. And what we know from research is they get a more extensive root system and you, that can lead to um, a more vigorous plant and you can get um, better yields. So that is something that I would definitely suggest that you do in your um, garden. As far as spacing, there, it differs for determinate and indeterminate plants, and this is all because of the size of the mature plant. And so within a row, for indeterminate plants, um, it's 18 to 36 inches, whereas determinate, you can space them a little bit closer at 15 to 24 inches. Now, these recommendations are developed for commercial growers, right? And so as gardeners, you can squeeze a few more plants in, um, you know, you don't, you can, use a little bit closer spacing, but don't get it too close because you still want to have good airflow, good air circulation, because that can go a long way to help um, having dry foliage and not having diseases get started. But these, again, you can, you can do tighter spacing then, than you're seeing here in this slide. As far as harvesting, um, in Pennsylvania, in central Pennsylvania, um, you can see tomatoes from the fields from high tunnels starting in early June through the end of October. Um, and, and now, you know, we're getting a lot more hydroponic operations and where we're seeing them even year round from Pennsylvania, like local Pennsylvania um, um, tomatoes. And I'm sure it's the same case for you in, in Maryland. When you harvest, you want them to be well formed, uh, free from cracks, again, that food safety kind of issue, um, free from scars and blemishes. Um, 
um, are uh, another important feature when you're um, harvesting your tomatoes. If they turn a color, um, make sure that they've turned that color. There is an interesting um, like side note. Uh, there are several years ago where we were growing this pink tomato, right? It matured to pink. And when we took it to, um, we had a, um, a, a CSA on campus at the time, people didn't want that tomato because it was pink and they thought it wasn't ripe, even though that was the mature um, color. So just think about the color it's supposed to be when you bought it and then look for it to, to be that color. So peppers, and so this is a picture of um, the hatch um, chili, um, which is my favorite type of pepper, but I'm also talking about bell peppers um, as well. So they are 15 to 36 inches tall. They're erect. They have many branches. They're compact. And so they're erect, right? So you don't have to maybe consider trellising like you do with your tomatoes. But staking, I'm going to show you a picture of that later, is something that you might consider anyway. Um, they have the same environmental requirements as tomato, but they're more sensitive to cold temperatures. So you have to really watch that. The days to maturity are going to vary wildly depending on what um, cultivars that you get and whether or not you're getting a bell pepper or another type of pepper. They're categorized as mild, sweet, hot, or pungent. And this is just a side note. Pungency is determined by the environment um, and also by the amount of capsaicin. So it's genetics and the environment. There was um, some research that was done at, in um, New Mexico where they grow a lot of um, hot peppers and they looked at the exact same cultivar throughout one field. Okay, so one cultivar, one field, and then they would go to individual plants and determine the um, hot, heat, hot level, the heatness level. Anyway, um, they found same cultivar, same field, but there was differences depending on where the plant was in the field. So there's little micro environments around each of those plants in the field that determined how hot they got. So that hotness is going to be determined by the genetics and the environment. And you might have a plant growing right next to each other in your garden, same cultivar, and one is hotter than the other. Um, again, there's micro environments. Peppers are also self-pollinated, just like um, tomatoes, but there's also a percentage of cross-pollination that occurs. The nectar in these flowers are attracted to bees, and so um, you will see bees around your pepper plants, although they're not as attractive to, as other plants, like, for example, cucumbers. So who is doing that cross-pollination is not exactly clear. It might be ants, it might be bees um, or other insects, but there is a small percentage of cross-pollination that occurs. For peppers, the flowers will open after sunrise and then an individual flower remains open for less than a day. And so that pollination needs to occur during that day that that flower is open. For transplants, if you're growing them yourself, they need to be a little bit older than um, tomato transplants. Again, you can plant them earlier, you can plant them later. We know this from research. The reason that we have these recommendations is because if you grow them smaller, um, have, you've probably done this. If you grow them a little bit um, smaller, they're kind of hard to get out of the cell, right? You don't have the root ball that's kind of holding the soil together. Um, and if you grow them later, you know, to be like 10 weeks old or whatever. If you're growing them commercially, there's more cost to that. You're going, you're paying for the greenhouse space, the lighting, the fertilizer, the labor, et cetera. So the six to eight is kind of like a, the sweet spot in the middle where it's easier to get out of the, the pot, but it's also you're minimizing your cost to produce it. So, but you, again, you, if they're younger or older, you can plant them. You want to set them outside after the danger of frost and soil temperatures again at that three inch depth are about 50 uh, degrees Fahrenheit minimum. Um, and as I mentioned, they're more sensitive to temperature extremes than tomatoes. They, they don't really recover from serious shock or stunting. Um, just like with tomatoes, you have to watch out for poor fruit set. Um, and you see in, especially in comparison to tomatoes, there's a lot more blossom drop with tomatoes during periods of cooler, hot weather, but they, just like tomatoes, they recover once the temperatures um, go back into um, the range where they grow optimally. 
planting, again, just like with tomatoes, you can plant that up to the cotyledons, which are these two, or you can even plant them um, deeper um, up to this first true leaf, and they will get a stronger root system, and which can lead to more yield. Planting systems, it's gonna be very similar as to your tomatoes. Research has shown though with the plastic culture system, black against the workhorse, we saw red being another color for tomatoes. For peppers, what research has shown is silver is another good um, color for um, growing peppers in. If you're growing them commercially, what farmers do is this is a plastic culture bed. Okay, we've got that raised bed underneath this plastic, there's a line of drip tape the center of this row to the center of this row is six to eight feet. And a lot of that is, is, um, is dependent on the farmer's equipment. Okay, so if they have equipment that makes them wider, that's what they do. If they have the equipment that makes it more narrow, that's what they'll do. And then within a row, you have 12 to 18 inches um, between plants in a row. And so here we have a staggered row. You can also do a solid row um, and it's uh, 12 to 18 inches. Again, this is commercial farming. If you want it, you can squeeze a few more in there, but be careful about having good airflow. You can also use bare ground systems in order to produce your peppers. So staking. Staking is something with peppers that you may or you may not need it. And some of that's just gonna be determined by experience or maybe you're just going to stake them automatically or not stake them just depending on you know what you want to do sometimes if you don't stake the plant what will happen is they lodge so they just kind of flop over if they if there's certain cultivars that get larger and so you may just want to start off with stakes like you see in this picture here or you may say it doesn't really matter if they fall over i'm just gonna you know it'll be fine if when they do fall over the danger is now the leaves aren't covering all the fruit. And so some of those peppers might be exposed to direct sunlight and you can have some sun scald. Um, so those are kind of the, the things to consider whether or not you're gonna stake or not. Commercially, it's very much um, uh, an economic thing, right? Does it make sense for me to stake them or am I gonna have enough loss from lodging um, from sun scald that it makes sense for me to put in the stakes and you know go through the labor of the training and all that. So um, commercially, it's very much an economic consideration. I also wanted to point out the system that's being used in this picture. So here is some black plastic. This one is being used on flat ground so they don't have the, the raised bed. But this is really, really nice for uh, managing weeds. It, it goes a long way to help suppress them. You can see with the black plastic, however, that it does not, it's impermeable. So it's not allowing like the rainwater to go through the plastic. So you definitely need to keep up with the watering on, on this. Um, the other thing you could do is use like a landscape fabric, which is what I like to use in my garden. Um, and then I get the benefit of the plastic in that it's managing weeds. It's also, um, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, increasing soil temperatures, that's where I was going, um, but it also lets the moisture through. So then I, I can back off a little bit of my watering when there's um, a periods of a lot of rain. Harvesting um, for bell peppers, you harvest them at the green mature stage. This is when they reach the full size or if they turn color, once they turn that color. So when it's green is when it's a little bit tricky because most of them start off as green so what you want to do is like squeeze them and if they have a little firmness to them and the the um the rind is shiny then it's probably a good time to harvest if not then it probably needs to stay on there a little bit longer the same with other types of peppers they need to have that thick flesh and you can really tell it by just squeezing on the pepper and if it's a little bit tough it's you know the if before it gets that thick flesh, it has a lot of give to it. If that after the thick flesh, it's it doesn't have that give to it. And then they're shiny green, or if they've turned a color, if that's what um, you want. So if you're growing, for example, a red bell pepper and it's green and then it, and it's mature green, you can harvest it. You don't have to wait for it to turn red if you don't if you don't want to. In fact, we're growing um, a cultivar called Orangela which is an orange bell pepper with some students in the hydroponics class that I teach. And we have, nobody has enough patience to let them turn orange. So we always just harvest them um, when they turn mature green. And then cucumbers. 
So cucumbers, there are monoecious and gynoecious types of cucumbers. So monoecious um, means that you have separate female and male flowers on an individual plant. Um, I always think of the M as being married. So you have the male and the female on one plant. And then gynoecious cultivars um, are plants that produce primarily the female flowers. And so with a monoecious cultivar, what happens is you have like 10, maybe 20 male flowers that are produced, and then you have the female flower that's produced. And the female flowers are the ones that produces the fruit. So then you get your fruit. And then there's gonna be a certain uh, number of male flowers before another female flower is produced. With these gynoecious cultivars, what happens is they're primarily female flowers. So you can get more fruit from them. They are vining plants. They can grow six to eight inches tall if you're just you know, letting them grow on the ground. Um, um, they can spread 10 to 20 feet. Um, if you trellis them, obviously, you know, you're saving some of that space. The optimal temperature is 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. These plants are um, plant pantropical. They will take the heat as long as they have um, enough moisture. So when it gets really hot out there, be sure that you're watching the moisture really carefully. They're just like tomatoes and peppers in that after they reach a certain temperature, in this case, it's a little bit higher, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you have reproductive issues. And what happens is that the plant will start producing more male flowers. And if you don't have a lot of male flowers, then you don't have a lot of fruit. Again, this corrects once temperatures get below 95, then you'll go back to the male female flower thing. But above then, you might have like a, a stretch where you're not getting a lot of fruit. Um, and then also below 50 degrees, the plants won't um, uh, pr fruit as well either. Pollination. So these plants are cross-pollinated. And, and especially when you think about, you know, you have separate male and female flowers, there needs to be something that's moving the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. And primarily that is um, bees. And so that cross pollination needs to occur. And so this is important because um, using row covers um, is one way that you can help to prevent having like cucumber beetles, for example, um, squash bugs is another example. It's like a physical barrier to prevent these insects from getting to your cucumber plants but the plants also need to be pollinated. So if you do do that, and a lot of commercial farmers do do that, I try to do that in my garden too with the row cover, um, you need to take off the row cover once the plants start flowering, because if you don't, then you're not gonna get the pollination to occur and you won't get fruit set. So planting, um, a lot of folks will do successive planting, meaning they'll plant today and then they'll plant like a month later or maybe halfway through the season, um, just you know, depending on their needs um, in order to have cucumbers throughout the growing season. Because what happens with cucumbers is there's a couple of diseases. We've got um, downy mildew and we've got powdery mildew. And It'll come and it'll infect the plant and then the plant starts being less productive um, and going downhill. And so you take out that first planting when that happens, but now your second planting is still going and you're still harvesting cucumbers. So that's a lot of, of the reason why folks will do that type of, of successive planting with their cucumbers. A cucumber transplant is ready um, when they're two to four weeks old. So if you're growing them at home, um, you don't need to, um, grow them for as long as a tomato or a pepper. These are grown commonly by farmers in those plastic culture systems with the raised bed, the drip irrigation, um, black plastic. Uh, actually, this whole family, um, the second color that is used quite a bit is blue. Um, and the in-row spacing is nine to 12 inches with four to five feet between rows. Again, that depends on the farmer's equipment. And again, as gardeners, we can fudge that. We can make the, that spacing more tight. 
Harvesting occurs from late June all the way through October. You can harvest any stage before the fruit turns yellow. When we're harvesting cucumbers, we are not harvesting them when they are um, botanically mature. We're harvesting them when they're horticulturally mature. So as far as the botany goes, the fruit is not mature. Like I, if it's a seeded cultivar, I can't take those seed and plant them and they'll produce a new plant because the seed is not mature. There, we went to a commercial farm and they had a cultivar that was supposed to be like six to eight inches long. They were harvesting them like much short, smaller, like they were about three or four inches long and they were much thinner. Like maybe you could get two or three bites out of them. And they just had a market where that's what, you know, their customers wanted. You, so this is just to point out, you can harvest them anytime um, before they turn yellow. Slicing cucumbers are generally harvested when they're over five inches long and slender. They have um, usually ribbing and you want um, slight ribbing still when you harvest them. Um, and again, the seed is immature. If you're growing pickling cucumbers, you harvest them whenever they reach the size that you want them to be. If you're harvesting either type, slicing or pickling, you're going to have to be on top of it, meaning that you'll have to be out there in your garden two to three times a week harvesting them before they go mature. Because what happens is with a cucumber, if the fruit starts going mature, um, meaning it's turning yellow, the seeds are getting mature, then the plant um, uh, will stop producing fruit it, or slows down producing fruit. It feels like it's more towards the end of its life cycle. So in order to maximize the plants um, producing fruit, we need to harvest that fruit before it reaches that mature stage. Okay, so that was just some information about um, cultivars and then also each of the individual crops, some in, in, information specific to them. And then I was also asked to talk a little bit about integrated um, pest management. And so that's what the, the end of this is going to be about. So integrated pest management is um, a way to manage pests where you're focused on prevention first. Um, and then you've got some tools that you try to use to manage the pest with your very last, last strategy being pesticides. And so the goal of this is to reduce the need for pesticides. Um, commercials, farmers use this method. I use it in my garden. My personal philosophy in my garden is I don't like to um, spray pesticides. I have kids, I have um, a dog. I, I just don't, I don't personally like to do that. So if it gets to that point, usually what I personally do is buy whatever it is from the grocery store. So this is the reason I'm telling you this is because you need to think about you and your philosophy too. This is a triangle um, for integrated pest management that shows the different levels of um, approaching managing pests. And so first you start with cultural methods, um, things like site selection, using resistant cultivars that we talked about, just growing your plants so that they can be their most healthy and vigorous, you know, good fertility, irrigation, all that stuff. That is um, cultural uh, management. And so these are ways that you can avoid having a pest happening. And then we've got physical and mechanical. And so we've, uh, I've mentioned a couple of these, like the row cover over cucumbers for um, some of those beetles, for example, that's a physical barrier, right? So that's, um, that would fall into this, or those mulches for weeds, that's a physical barrier that's gonna suppress your weeds. Mechanical um, is um, like for some insects, for example, if you just go out there and spray your plants with um, water, like the water hose, they will, it'll wash them off. Or um, in, in my garden, I have this pair of gloves that I put on whenever I have um, cabbage worms on my uh, brassicas and I go out and that's the gloves that I squish all of those worms with. That's mechanically um, um, controlling them. Then there's the next level is biological control. And so this is where we use um, natural enemies of pests. Um, we bring them in or we promote them in our gardens to have them take care of the pests in the garden. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some results from some research that we did with some of those plants to attract some of these natural enemies. And then the last 
um, part of this is your pesticides. And even within your pesticides, there's a couple of levels where first you're going to try pesticides that are have a little bit safer chemistries, like your insecticidal soaps, your oils, baking sodas, etc., before you move into um, more conventional pesticides that kill on contact. So if we look at this triangle again, um, more towards the bottom, we're going from prevention. Um, toward the top, we get to intervention. And as far as toxicity, um, at the bottom, we have um, more non-toxic methods until we get to the very top where we're using pesticides, which are toxic. So it's just using this, pretty much every tool in the toolbox in order to try to manage those pests. So this is the general approach. You're going to build your knowledge base, um, monitor your plants, if you find something, you got to make decisions about what you're seeing. And then intervention is like, OK, now that I know what I, my problem is, what am I going to do about it? And it all boils down to keeping good records. So I'm just going to look at each one of these things um, a little more in depth. So first, you want to build your knowledge base. And so you got to know what's normal for your plants in order to know what's abnormal. Um, I saw a, a picture of a, a watermelon the other day. A plant pathologist was showing us it was a tomato, or excuse me, a watermelon, and it had like these yellow spots on it, right? And it was a cultivar that was called Moon and Stars. But if you didn't know that that's what the cultivar was, you might think, oh, I've got a disease here or something's wrong. So it's really important to know what's normal um, or like those pink tomatoes, right? Um, where people thought something's wrong, they're not ripe. So you gotta know what's normal for, for your plants. Um, and so you can find that out by, first of all, like knowing what cultivars you're putting in your garden, but also determining like, what are common problems? What are things that might show up in my garden? So you're, you're going to monitor, um, and this is where you're going to be out there. You're going to watch uh, closely um, for uh, pests. So it's really important that you stay on top of this, like at least once a week, because if there's an outbreak, it can be quick. So like, for example, last um, um, gardening season in my garden, I had some aphids that came in and pretty much got on all my cucurbits. Um, but I got out there early and I was able to squish them. I was able to use the mechanical method before they exploded. If they had exploded, then I would have had to consider other methods um, to control them or, or decide not to control them, whatever I decided to do. But since I had been watching them, when the first few showed up, I was able to take care of it. Biocontrol, so if you're going to do things like um, release ladybugs or lacewings, for example, their success of that being successful is much higher if you catch the problem when it's very small. If you've got a big problem, for example, with aphids, then you're bringing in biocontrols, the chances of that being successful goes way down. Um, so again, you want to just closely monitor your plants. So say you have been monitoring and then you're like something is wrong here i know that this is not normal for what i'm growing so the next thing is to determine why you know what is causing the problem is it caused by a living organism or is it something environmental um, is it something you know environmental things like is it my my fertility practices did i plant the plants too deep um that sort of thing so when you're looking at your plants, you're going to look for signs and symptoms. Signs are direct evidence of a pest. So we've got our eggs um, or frass, um, if it's an insect, webbing, if it's a, a mite, spores, mycelium, if it's um, some sort of a, a fungus that's causing the problem. The nice thing about seeing a sign is it's direct evidence of the pest, and it can sometimes help you get to what's causing the problem a lot quicker. Um, symptoms are indirect evidence. And so things like wilting, leaf spotting, yellowing, misshapen leaves. So if I have wilting, this could be caused by my irrigation practices. This can also be caused by, um, you know, a blight. So the symptoms, when you find them, you usually have to do a little more digging in order to figure out what the problem is. 
So one thing to do is to look at the distribution of the symptoms. If the symptoms are uniform, um, then it's probably environmental. So if I have wilting um, tomato plants and I have four different cultivars of tomatoes and they're all showing that symptom, it's probably not because of a disease. It's probably because maybe I'm not watering enough. Um, I, need, um, I, need, I might need to look at that, for example. If the distribution is patterned or spotty, then it could be a living organism or it could be um, an environment. So you still need to do a little more digging into it if that's what the, the distribution is. So environmental causes, they can be human error. Um, for example, I maybe I over apply fertilizer or um, maybe I didn't take off my row cover and that's why I'm not getting fruit, those sorts of things. Um, site selection in your soil or, or could be another issue. So think about, for example, drainage, think about exposure to the sun. Um, planting techniques, um, you can over or even under um, plant. Um, we visited a strawberry farmer and all of the plants were kind of um, like I don't know, like half an inch or an inch out of the soil because they hadn't been planted deep enough. And that was part of the issue. So um, planting too deep, planting too shallow. Nutrient management can also um, be an issue. Uh, irrigation, um, temperature, right? If the temperatures go above 95, maybe that's why you're not having um, fruit. And then physiological disorders. Um, uh, for sim for living organisms, and you also need to look at the, the symptoms. And there's a lot of great resources for doing this, um, especially um, on the internet. But it's really important to first figure out what's causing the problem. Um, because if you don't know exactly what's causing the problem, then you don't really know exactly how to fix the problem. And visual symptoms can be difficult to separate. You know, is this a problem that's caused by nutrition or do I have an issue with a, a virus? You know, you, you, it's really important to get down to the root cause before you can make any corrective action. So um, you can verify your diagnosis using your extension service. This is Penn State Extension where they have a, a nice search feature where you can just, you know, put in tomato diseases and you'll get a bunch of pictures and a bunch of information. Um, but there are also other places on the web too for you to look for that sort of information. So once you have figured out you have a problem and what the problem is, now you can make decisions about how you're going to solve the problem. And so cultural and ta uh, tactics would include on the bottom of that triangle again, they include modifying the environment, um, anything to avoid having the issue, uh, maintaining healthy plants, um, choosing a great site, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna show you a few examples of these next. So you wanna start with healthy transplants and seeds. As a plant person, in my garden, this is harder than it sounds. When I go to a garden center, I might see a plant that everyone's overlooking and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I can save that plant, but really I should leave it behind because it's really hard to start with something that isn't of good quality and then end up with something of good, with good quality. It's much easier if I start with good quality to end with good quality. And this goes for the, with seed as well. So when you get seed, use reputable um, sources for both your transplants and your seed and leave the unhealthy ones behind. Resistant cultivars, so we talked about that um, earlier. Um, this is a fabulous picture, I think. This is from Beth Gugino. She is a plant pathologist here at Penn State. And she was doing a trial where she was looking at different cultivars with resistance to um, late blight. And so you can see that some of these cultivars didn't do well. She said that this is um, kind of like the guinea pig for studying diseases on, um, uh, for fight, uh, late blight. And she said like, you could just say late blight and the plants just start dying. But look at these, these are other cultivars back here that even though there's a lot of late blight in that field, they did fine. So starting off the res resistant cultivars is really a great way to go. Good moisture management, um, planting in well-drained soils, good weed management. For uh, weeds, sometimes, um, 
in my garden anyway, um, they can get ahead of me. Um, but really, I need to stay ahead of them, especially like if I have tomatoes and I'm worried about having early blight or late blight, if I have weeds like nightshades um, that are also in the um, tomato family, then that can cause, um, or that can be a spot for that hosts these diseases. And so it's really important to stay on top of your weeds, um, to have good irrigation practices. So here's a, a case where we've got some tomatoes, they're growing on landscape fabric. So that's really a good barrier for the weeds. Um, they're growing them up. We've got our tomato cages. The, they're using tighter spaces than you would see commercially. And I would wonder in this particular case, because these plants still have a ways to go, if they're planted maybe a tad too tight, where you could have issues with having good airflow throughout this planting. And so then you can have high humidity, things won't dry off as quickly, and that could be um, a situation where you have diseases um, get, getting going. So good moisture management is really important. And then proper spacing, right? So again, you can fiddle with the recommended spacings, but this is, this is definitely not a good situation in this picture right here. Mechanical tactics. So once the pest is present, you can physically hand pick them off. Or in the case of like early blight um, or even um, late blight, if it's on the leaves, taking off or powdery mildew on cucurbits, taking off some of those first leaves can help to slow that disease down if, if you're taking those leaves away from the garden. Um, using barriers like row covers like we talked about or um, um, traps, um, hand weeding. In this picture right here, um, the, there are some aphids that are being um, um, mechanically removed from the plants by spraying them off with, the, with water. And then biological control. This right here is biological control. This is lace wings that was being released in a high tunnel. The interesting things about lace wing larva is they're cannibalistic. So each one of these sections, there is a different larva and it's as soon as you get it, you're supposed to put it out because if they find each other, they will start eating each other. And so you can um, buy in different natural enemies like this. Um, if you're in an outdoor setting though, um, they, if there's not enough food in your garden, meaning there's not enough aphids or whatever to support them. They're just going to fly off and go off to someplace else. They really work better in contained environments. Natural habitat plants are another way, though, to attract some of these natural enemies. And so we did a little bit of research uh, where we were looking at some different plants for their ability to attract tr different natural enemies like ladybugs and parasitoid wasps, for example. And we found alyssum was a really um, nice plant to do that. Um, there, it's a pretty plant anyway. It smells really good anyway. And it grows well during the summer, but also in the shoulder seasons in the spring and the fall. And um, we found that they attracted quite a few of those natural enemies. So maybe putting a few of these in your garden can help to attract those and help to manage some of those pests. So some keys for success is um, to practice prevention um, um, and use pesticides as a last resort. I love this slide. This is um, something that was put together by Scott DeLoretto. He's our greenhouse manager. And so he talks about a clean start. And so this is where you're using all those preventative strategies, um, where you're trying to avoid having a problem. And what it does is it gives you this longer honeymoon period. Um, so you don't see pests, if, they, if you are, until much later in the growing season. And then if you do have a problem that you need to spray, you don't need to spray as often as if you start off and you're not thinking about these avoiding um, these avoidance practices, then those pests can come in a lot sooner. And if you do use pesticides, you might have to use them more often. And then the last thing is um, to keep records of what you do so you know it works and what didn't work. Um, I, you know, as gardeners, I think there's a tendency to think, oh, I'll remember that, but a lot happens between this growing season and next growing season. So it's important to keep good records. And that was it, folks. Um, that's uh, growing tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers. And again, if you need to get a hold of me, there's my email address. And I think there's a couple of minutes for questions, but I'm going to hand that off to uh, Dick and, and Chuck to, to, to determine that for, for sure. <laughs>
We do have a couple of minutes, Elsa, so thank you very much. Um, the first question that came in was whether or not you had any particular favorites for seed catalogs for tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers. I personally love the Johnny's catalog they, and website. They have really nice pictures. They're in Maine. A lot of their stuff grows well in our area and they have a lot of variety. They sell to commercial farmers, but they also sell in smaller packets that are perfect for homeowners too. Um, I usually buy a few things from them for my garden. I get my row covers from them. You can get plastic if you want to do that and, and landscape fabric too. So it's more than just seeds that they have. It's one of my, my favorite ones. Great. Um, do you have any comments about watering from uh, rain barrels that are collecting water from roofs? Right. I, we have a couple of rain barrels here at my house and I do use them. One thing to consider, however, is um, the food safety. Like if there are birds that have droppings on your roof, there's the potential for that to get into your um, water as well. So you have to be at least consider that. And whenever I'm using my water for my rain barrels, I'm definitely not watering overhead. I'm definitely watering at the base of the plant. And if you can avoid using that water on things like onions or potatoes or even like pumpkins that are touching the ground, if you suspect that you have, um, um, you know, droppings on your roof, then that is an, a way to avoid that being an issue. Okay. Is there a reason to favor trellises or cages over each other? No, they, they, they both work equally effectively. I think that's just a matter of preference, really. Um, and maybe cost, too. Um, I, I tend to like to make them in my garden. I, I don't know. It's just a fun thing to do. But I've, I've also used tomato commercial tomato cages, too, and they work just fine. There's, there's no real, you know, advantage or disadvantage to one over the other. It's a lot of preference. Great. You talked about using determinant tomatoes in containers. Is there a reason not to use indeterminant in containers? No, you can. It's just that when you buy cultivars that are specifically for containers, those are determinant type tomatoes. But you can definitely grow indeterminate tomatoes um, as well in a container that plants tend to get bigger. So you'll have to watch the watering a little bit more. And you may have to think um, about uh, different ways for uh, trellising them if that is, you know, something that you want to do. But there, you can definitely grow them in containers as well. You talked about the, the impact of hot weather on pollination of tomatoes. Can you hand pollinate tomatoes? Yes, definitely. Um, and actually, I mentioned that we grow them um, hydroponically as well. And, and that's what we do. Um, it, if you have a large enough acreage, what a commercial farmer will do is introduce bees. But if not, we use electric bees, which is just kind of this wand that kind of vibrates. And you just touch the back of the flower and you see the pollen drop. And people can use like um, um, electric toothbrushes and it'll do the same type of thing. Um, and that works well in hot weather? If you can get the pollen to the stigma, yes, because that is the issue is that the pollen is not reaching the stigma. Um, and can you speak to tomato set spray? What, what does it do? I have heard of tomato set spray. Somebody was telling me about that. I haven't used it. I'm not really sure what it is. That is something that I want to look into. Um, and uh, there was a question about what is drip tape okay. in conjunction with plastic culture? Okay. So drip tape is kind of like a hose. We call it a tape. So it's like a, 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 a thin tubing. And then within that tubing, there are these um, emitters or these little holes spaced anywhere from four to 12 inches. And then you can set that up either like on a timer or uh, to your um, spigot or whatever. And it'll push the water through that tape and then as it does, the water slowly comes out of those um, holes in the tape and it waters the plant that way. It's a really efficient way of irrigating. Great. Um, and uh, one more uh, question here about the, the end of the season. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a particularly good way to get green tomatoes to turn red at the end? And does the, will unripe peppers continue ripening inside? 
it depends if they've reached that mature green stage. If they've reached the mature green stage, then yes, they'll keep going. If they haven't, then they won't. So um, for um, a pepper, like if it's not firm, then it hasn't reached that mature green and shiny. If it has, it won't continue to grow if you've harvested it from the plant. Um, the same with um, tomatoes. If they've reached the mature green stage, um, which is again, they're like, you know, like that darker green or that shiny green, then they'll continue to ripen. If not, then you'll have um, a green tomato, which isn't a bad thing if you have a good recipe. No, it isn't. My wife made some delicious ones last week. Um, uh, well, thank you very much. I know that we're slightly over our time here and we need a break before the next presentation. So um, I want to thank you and I'll turn it back over to Steve to extend his thanks. Yes. Thanks, Chuck. And thank you. Uh, thank everyone. And I hope everyone has a good day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.